we do not have any evidence that the current variation of genotypes are jeopardizing the effect of the vaccination. So from this point of view, I'm not afraid. And if I should send a message to, to producers or veterinarians, is that the use, the current use of existing vaccines should protect against PCV2 systemic disease. Peter Best, welcome to Meet the Expert, the series of podcasts on swine health management in practice brought to you by Beringer Ingelheim. With me for this episode of Meet the Expert is veterinary pathologist uh, Professor Joachim Sigalis, who is uh, the professor in the Department of Animal Health and Anatomy in the Veterinary Faculty at the UAB University in Barcelona, and also he's a researcher at Spain's Creza Animal Health Research Center. Professor Seglas has investigated swine diseases for the last three decades, I think, and has co-authored over 350 peer-reviewed publications, most of them on pig disease topics and many specifically on porcine circovirus diseases. Professor Seglas, uh, thank you for talking to us on Meet the Expert. Thank you very much. My pleasure. It's your expertise in porcine circovirus associated diseases that I'd like to talk to you about in this episode, please. How long ago did your own study of these PCVAD conditions start? Yeah, we, we started working with PCVADs uh, exactly in 1997. And it was a very, let's say, fortuitous situation because uh, at that year, uh, in 1997, specifically on March 1997, I attended the American Association of Swine uh, Practitioners meeting in, in Quebec City, in Canada. And, and I met uh, Dr. Ted Clark and Dr. John Harding that they presented a presumably new uh, disease called post-winning multisystemic wasting syndrome. As a pathologist, uh, I was very interested in trying to see which were those lesions in the new disease. So when Dr. Ted Clark presented the condition, I was thinking by myself that, damn it, I have never seen something like that. So uh, we do not have such disease in Spain. But when coming back just a couple of months afterwards, we received a number of samples of a condition that at least clinically resembled those uh, that presented by Drs. Harding and Clark. And amazingly, we diagnosed for the first time the, what it was called at that time PMWS in Spain. Afterwards, we realized that the disease had been with us at least 10 years before. So it's very clear that one is not able to diagnose what is not really known. And that was our problem at that time. But since then, uh, we have been working especially on, on different research projects, uh, as well as uh, with vaccines, especially with contracts with companies. And it has been during the last 24 years. So from this point of view, we have we had a very extensive knowledge on PCB2 and their diseases. When you started uh, at that uh, swine practitioners meeting in Quebec with Ted Clark and John Hardy, they were describing PMWS as a disease, but at that point the association to a circovirus was known or was not known? Well, it was a matter of tremendous controversy at that time, because of course we, we, we came from a history that porcine circovirus as a such, without any type, it was what we call nowadays porcine circovirus type one, it was considered non-pathogenic for swine. So the, the very first link saying, hey, it seems that nowadays PCB is able to cause disease, it was received in a very skeptical manner, both in the scientific and veterinary communities. So from this point of view, those first studies in which Dr. Gordon Allen from Northern Ireland participated quite importantly, in fact, they found by immunohistochemistry the presence of PCB2 antigen by means of using antibody against the PCB, the type 1. So, and that was uh, very curious because at the very end, it was clear that uh, a virus that at least cross-reacted partially with the PCB type 1, the, the cell contaminant, was there and was there in, in a huge amount. So from this point of view, uh, we start seeing in our, ourselves as well, huge amount of this novel PCB 
uh, in the tissues of sick animals. However, the, the, the balance between the PCB1, which was non pathogenic, and the eventual new PCB2, which was considered at that time pathogenic, divided considerably the scientific and veterinary communities. But anyway, even though uh, at the very end it was demonstrated that the PCB affecting the sick animals was clearly different from the one which was known as cell contaminant. Mm. Now, the, the contrast today, of course, uh, we know quite a lot about diseases in swine due to porcine circovirus type 2, as we now know it. Uh, do we know everything we need to know, or is there still, still, still some more things to be researched and discovered? Well, it's true that uh, we did, uh, not, not just us, a number of groups on the, uh, around the world, uh, uh, very interesting uh, research, especially between the years 1997 and 2007, because at the very end, the, the, the disease hit it very importantly worldwide with tremendous losers at economical level. Uh, and we could get quite interesting information, especially on epidemiology, some uh, important information as well on immunity and as well pathogenesis. However, the full pathogenesis of the disease was not really known at that time. However, when the vaccines came into the market and demonstrated a tremendous efficiency under field conditions, at the very end, almost everything was stopped in terms of basic research and everything went towards the use of the vaccine to control the disease, to make a number of, uh, let's say, scientific insights on how vaccines work, but very, let's say, relevant questions and in terms of how this virus works and how this virus is able to cause disease are still a number of question marks. So not everything on PCB2 is solved. However, the major problem for practitioners and for farmers is solved, which is very important. Yes, indeed. But we know it as a, a number of variants these days, of course, and uh, it's just one of the confusing factors. Uh, as veterinary advisors to commercial pork producers, should we be concerned about this development of variants of PCV2? Well, PCV2 is a fast evolving virus. It's probably one of the fastest ones uh, as DNA viruses. Uh, from this point of view, the possibility of, gene of generating variants is, is, is there, and it's very clear. It's true that we, we never use the, the word variant for PCB2. Variant is a wording that has been extremely popular nowadays with SARS-CoV-2. But when we have been talking about PCB2 and different sequences, we have classified them into genotypes. And the, the genotypes, what they really represent is the variability at the genetic level that the virus may have. But of course, the most important issue here is if those variabilities observed at genetic level if they have a kind of translation at especially uh, epitope level and especially regarding immunity. Is it possible that the immunity generated against one genotype could be different from the one generated uh, in front of another genotype and even more could be non cross protecting for example the most, the, let's, let's say that the most recent information that we have is that so far with the existing genotypes, and I'm talking about the major genotypes that has been found all over the time, which is PCB2A, PCB2B, and PCB2D, it's clear that there's cross protection among them. So current vaccines, current existing vaccines are able to cover, to protect against those three genotypes. Even they are slightly different at a genomic level. And we have to, uh, to say that at this point, we know at least nine different genotypes. Everything it depends, of course, on the way of classifying such genotypes, because classifications have been changing over time, because at the very beginning, it was a short number of sequences. So with such low number of sequences, uh, a very simple uh, discrimination about genotypes was possible. But nowadays, the virus has been evolving much more uh, the number of bar uh, the variabilities that we have observed at genetic uh, level is much higher. So we have to refine our genotype definition. And with the most recent genotype definition, we have at least nine. Even those three that I mentioned before are the most prevalent ones by far difference. Do you understand then that uh, today the commercial vaccines we have do give us 
coverage, immunity, protection uh, against this range of genotypes, uh, A, B, and uh, D. Uh, but you've described this virus as being rapidly changing. Uh, do we have to think that it's inevitable at some stage that our four sign circovirus vaccines will have to be modified to take account of this development? This is a very interesting question, and probably we do not have a clear-cut answer to that. What we know so far is that at least uh, against those three genotypes, there's cross-protection. Of course, we cannot state if this cross-protection is 100%. It could be some variability. However, we have not been able to calculate which is the level of cross-protection amongst those genotypes. However, as you indicated, the fast-evolving situation of PCV2 will imply in the future to appear new genotypes. This will be unavoidable, and they will appear. The point here is if those new genotypes of those new variations that appear will continue being, being protected by the current uh, existing vaccines. For the reason, it's very important to monitor PCV2s and the different genotypes that they are appearing, because at the very end, they are telling us if what is happening nowadays in the vaccines will be a length in time with them. But at this point, we cannot ensure. However, there's a very important point. Most of the vaccines worldwide, and especially in Europe, are based on PCV2A. The most frequent detect, frequently detected genotype nowadays in Europe is PCV2D, and followed close by by PCV2B. However, those vaccines still work and works very well. Uh, one always may uh, say, could it happen that a vaccine based on PCV2B or the boot work even better? Sometimes when you have a very efficient vaccines, to see teeny differences is extremely difficult because uh, unless you do side-by-side -side, uh, experiments, and when I say experiments, I mean with huge number of animals, it's almost impossible to see if there's any difference. But even though nowadays, in spite of multiple genotypes, we still consider, I insist nowadays, that we have one single serotype with PIPCV2. And this is what explains that there's the, such cross-protection so far. Oh, will do. Well, that's reassuring to that point. Uh, I'm going to come back to vaccination and genotypes a little bit later, if I may, in this conversation. But at this point, uh, I'd like to, if you would allow, go back in history a bit, because I find, I'm afraid, the history of circoviruses in pigs a bit confusing, <laughs> Professor. Uh, you know, this is... Uh, as you said, we had PCV1, which was present in pigs without causing clinical disease, and then PCV2 comes along, seems to have been around at least since the 1960s in Asia, as well as Europe and North America, and at that stage, without causing disease, maybe, or at least not recognised as causing disease, until this wasting syndrome in weaned pigs started to be described, and that's 30 years ago. And then, as you said, that work in Western Canada by Harding and uh, Carr and attributing the disease to PCV2. But what I'd love to know, and I don't understand, uh, was PCV2 present in the population for 20 to 30 years before serious clinical problems arose? And if that's the case, what happened? Could it have been made more pathogenic somehow in the 90s, such as by changes in pork production practices? That's an excellent question, Peter. Uh, we know nowadays, and we can, you are pretty sure about that, that PCV2 was present uh, at least in, in Europe uh, during the 60s. So during the 60s uh, of the past century, uh, the, the virus was there, was infecting pigs, and we did not associate the virus with the disease, as you mentioned, by the end of the 90s. So this means that we have almost 30 or 35 years before we detect uh, a, a, new, a new disease that PCV2 has been there circulating in, importantly, but no evidence of disease. However, when I say no evidence of disease, probably I should say no recognition of the disease, which is not the same. Because at the very end, as I indicated to you before, you do not diagnose something that you don't know. So what could have happened uh, probably worldwide is that uh, uh, wasting disease like 
PMWS. Nowadays, we are talking about PCB2 systemic disease. But that probably this systemic disease have been unnoticed for a long period of time. And why unnoticed? First of all, uh, and if we look back uh, in the history, we have had tremendous uh, impacting diseases in the past, like uh, uh, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, African swine fever, pseudo rabies or Ojeski's disease virus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Many diseases that are tremendously impacting the, the the swine industry, and when you are able to control those, let's say, uh, more significant diseases, then you see other things. And for example, remember mycoplasmas. Who was talking about mycoplasmas, even if it's uh, known for a long time, but Exotic pneumonia has been a major problem, especially since 90s onwards. However, mycoplasma was there. Lausonia intracellularis, it has been important from 90s, 2000s onwards, but it, it was already there. So probably with PCB2 had happened something like this, but we have to remind that, especially in the 90s, it was a tremendous big change in the swine industry. Remember that a new disease, PERS, First virus uh, came not just in North America first, but in the whole in the whole world, almost changed the way of producing pigs. And for example, the switch from the typical farrow to finish operations with continuous flow, it was a big switch to three sites, uh, multi-site systems, etc. So, and when you are changing your production system, you are probably changing your profile of pathogens and when those pathogens are affecting. And not just that. We have changed production system, but we have changed genetics as well. When you are selecting for a number of potential, let's say, uh, traits which are important for production, more animals, hyperprolifics, etc., might be you are also uh, selecting for non-desirable traits like disease susceptibility. And we have observed that, for example, with the porcine uh, PCB2 systemic disease, there's a significant difference in terms of clinical appearance depending on the genetic background of those animals. So we believe that the systemic disease is a really multifactorial disease in which probably at a given time point, and of course there are big black holes still in the whole explanation, so everything is not clear. We do not have all the events that bring us uh, to, or brought us to, to the systemic disease, but there are a number of events that probably they occur at at more or less the same time that facilitates to a certain degree the provision of a disease linked with a virus was was which was already present in the in the in the swine livestock so from this point of view even it's difficult to explain uh, it's true that there's a number of pathogens that they went under notice for a long period of time before it, they were recognized as a true pathogen mm, yeah Thanks. Uh, my question was, I guess, driven to some degree, Kim, because, uh, you know, we're talking about an evolution of the virus in terms of its genotype diversity, I suppose, or are we actually talking about the fact we've become more efficient at detecting the different forms that exist? So we have these various genotypes always existed, and now we've become more aware of them or have they suddenly come out of the blue sky? Well, at the very end, we have started genotyping or, or sequencing in a serious manner during the last 20 years, mostly. Uh, in fact, uh, during or, or through the last uh, 40 years, uh, because here we are counting also retrospective studies, we, we have, uh, let's say, describing what it's called genotype shifts. Uh, we understand genotype shift as a kind of change in prevalence of particular genotypes over time. And for example, it was a very nice work from Danish colleagues in, uh, in 2007, in which they sequence uh, PCB2s existing during the 80s, during the 90s, and during the 2000s. Well, during the 80s, the, let's say the sequences that they could retrieve corresponded to PCB2C, which was discovered at that time, that particular genotype. Uh, afterwards, especially during the 90s, but in absence of overt outbreaks of PMWS, the dominating genotype in Denmark was PCB2A. 
But when the big outbreaks of disease, of the systemic disease appeared and the disease became extremely important in terms of, uh, in economical terms, then the most dominating uh, genotype was PCB2B. This genotype shift from A to B coinciding with the major clinical problems have been described in a number of countries worldwide. So for whatever reason, which is not really understood at this point uh, still, is the fact that the genotype shift from A to B coincided at least in time, so for, there's an epidemiological relationship with the, let's say, passing from an sporadic PMWS to a episodic PMWS. And the question mark here is, it could happen that PCV2B is more pathogenic than PCV2A, for example, but when you are going to experimental settings and sometimes to perform experimental uh, uh, studies with PCV2 is not that easy and even it's much more difficult to reproduce disease. But when it has been uh, compared side by side, PCV2A looks like as pathogenic as PCV2B or as PCV2D, as we have been observing afterwards. So we cannot explain such genotype shift just because of pathogenicity. Probably there are other factors which in, are involved in this change. And interestingly, when we start using PCV2 vaccines in a massive manner, especially around years 2008, 9, 10 onwards, another genotype shift has occurred from PCV2B to D. And nowadays, in most countries of the world, PCV2D is the most prominent one, the most frequent one. Again, vaccines were based on PCV2A. PCV2D was initially described as a mutant from PCV2B, not A. So it looks like the why, if I'm vaccinating uh, intensely against PCV2A, I have ca this kind of genotype. It's just another epidemiological coincidence, or there's something to do from immunological point of view. We still do not have the answers. We can speculate a lot on that, but the, we still need a number of answers for those genotype sheets, for example. I, I thought that, in fact, D was a mutant of B. It's, it, that's no longer considered its origin, then. Do I understand you that we've changed our mind about yeah, no, that? Yeah, no, no, sure. No, no, absolutely. PCV2D is what was initially called a mutant of PCV2B. <clears throat> However, uh, you have to take into account that those viruses are evolving simply by uh, mutations that are accumulated. But also there's a phenomenon of recombination. So recombination is something that could happen between even different genotypes. So one may say that from an immunological point of view that B and D should be closer between them, but in both cases they are protected against a vaccine that is based on PCV2A. So for the reason when we are talking about genotypes, one may say that this is very artificial because at the very end we are interested in talking about variants or, or, or genotypes when there are some kind of different biological properties of the virus. But at this stage, at least globally, there are not very much differences from a biological point of view. So from a biological point of view, they behave quite similarly and they are protected quite similarly as well. Let me pause for a moment to remind everyone that more information on this conversation, like articles, publications and videos, can be found on the website pers.com. So uh, the obvious question for me as a farm level person, therefore, has the change in predominant genotype affected in any way the situation we see on the farm? I mean, uh, you know, we started off with PCV2 as a PMWS scores and so on, uh, for in weaned pigs, does it occur in growing pigs or older pigs now? Or uh, is it more transmissible now than it was before? Or is in fact, is it causing reproductive problems in addition to its effects on weaned and growing pigs? Well, my perception is that the pathogenicity of the different PCV2s or the different genotypes of PCV2 is not apparently different. In fact, even nowadays, in which we are experiencing, in spite of vaccination, uh, some cases, which I would say that represents a very low percentage of our vaccinated farms, that they uh, 
they are suffering from the systemic disease is not due to the change of the virus, is probably due to the change in the epidemiology of virus. Because what we have been doing by means of mass vaccination is changing the epidemiology of PCV2. You, you have to think that before the existence of vaccines, the infectious pressure was quite high and the virus was circulating freely without major problem as soon as you have susceptible animals. And animals losing maternal derived immunity, of course, they are excellent animals for replicating uh, without any problem. So the virus replicates easily. However, by increasing the vaccination pressure, you certainly decrease the infectious pressure. And by doing so, you can create subpopulations of animals that may uh, be susceptible at a given time point when the immunity provided by the vaccine or the material derived immunity is gone. So I believe it's much more a matter of epidemiology rather than a matter of changing pathogenicity of genotypes or viruses. So that would be a change in the age of pig when it expresses clinical signs and uh, what you, you're saying there. I, I mentioned reproduction. Just to clarify on that, uh, are you saying there isn't really a reproductive element to PCV2 today? Well, what it's uh, known, and this is uh, well known since uh, two decades at least, is that PCV2 can cause reproductive problems. However, the frequency of such reproductive problems is probably very scarce, uh, mostly because at least at the breeding stock level, there's uh, a kind of general immunity which is important, so you never see big outbreaks of reproductive disease, but you may experience particularly some uh, let's say, occasional events of reproductive problem. What we do not know is which is the impact of the subclinical infection on the reproductive side. This is uh, not known at present, but what is important to indicate by means of massive vaccination and the change of epidemiology is that if I'm vaccinating the piglets, imagine exclusively, what we have seen is that we can create animals that reach a slaughterhouse age almost seronegative. Those animals, of course, in spite of the vaccination at winning approximately, this ha happened a period of at least six months approximately, and those animals without the booster of the natural infection, they do not have almost immunity. So imagine that you are taking those animals as replacement stock. Then it means that your replacement stock, unless you are not vaccinating them, those will become negative and you will introduce animals which are negative against PCV2 into your farm. Those animals, of course, are perfect, let's say, for being infected, even with a low infectious pressure. Because if you are adding susceptible animals, what you will achieve by doing so is to start again with the fire, because you are just adding susceptible animals to a place in which the virus is still there. And then you can explain certain reproductive problems or especially certain early infections in piglets, which could be one of the major reasons why you are experiencing sometimes, sometimes uh, they are very limited cases, but you can experience, for example, systemic disease in vaccinated piglets and at ages of six, seven, eight weeks of age. Do you think then that uh, we're not talking about something which is changing its frequency of problems, its type of problems, or the target pig, if you like, or even the target farm? Uh, none of these things has changed materially for because of the genotype uh, shift that you've mentioned, uh, as far as I am uh, aware. Uh, can I therefore pursue this in another way? Do you think there have been more uh, clinical problems suspected to relate to PCV submitted for diagnosis to, to diagnostic laboratories? Well, uh, I can speak for what we receive here uh, at our veterinary faculty because we are having a, a diagnostic service. Uh, and, and certainly there are still a number of suspicions of PCV2 infection by means because the, the animals show wasting, sometimes some generalized lymphadenopathy. But I must confess that very, very few cases are confirmed as a truly PCV2 systemic disease because when we are doing the necropsy and the histopathology of those animals, plus the detection of the virus, we are seeing in a very clear cut way that in most of the cases, the problems are purse, 
purge is hitting really, really importantly the, the, the swine livestock in our country and probably uh, all around the world. And very few cases are truly confirmed as uh, the systemic disease. And in those cases is what I told you before. Most of the cases are animals which are six, seven, eight week old, not older than that. So they are early cases compared to what we had 20 years ago, in which sometimes in the middle of the fattening period, you had tremendous cases of wasting, etc. So the, the, the epidemiological picture has changed, but the number of cases diagnosed is, is really low, is really low, at least to our hands. In spite, of course, that when you look by quantitative PCR or PCR or by serology, you may find infection with PCV2 quite often. However, here we have another problem, which is diagnostics. And how do you interpret the detection of the virus? Right. Uh, uh, let me interrupt you a minute, because I'd like to get on to that. Indeed, I think that's important. Before we do so, let me take a moment to say to our listeners and viewers, thank you for joining us in this episode of Meet the Expert, in which we're in conversation with Professor Joachim Segalis in Barcelona about swine diseases associated with the circovirus PCV2. Uh, so I'd like to concentrate on that point about diagnosis, please, Professor. Let's do it this way. Say a farm has a concern about pale, hairy, poor doing pigs. What would be the ideal submission a vet has to make to the lab to determine if the farm is undergoing a PCV associated disease? Yeah, in fact, the criteria for trying to pursue a diagnostic has not changed in the last 23 years. So from this point of view, if you have the type of pig that you are describing here, my ideal submission would be submit the whole pig, ideally the alive pig, in order to be as fresh as possible, in order to perform a complete necropsy. And then uh, certainly it will be important to analyze histopathologically different tissues, but mainly lymphoid tissues. Uh, there are uh, a clear cat lesions, which is lymphocyte depletion with granulatus inflammation, which is hallmark of PCV2 systemic disease. And we are very demanding. We want to see pigs uh, suffering from those lesions, but with moderate to high severity, as well as to find moderate to high amount of virus in those lesions. When you have such a situation, then you have an individual diagnosis of porcine circovirus to a systemic disease. So to me, it's very important also the selection criteria for your animals in order to establish the diagnosis. Because the typical wasted animal, uh, rough hair, uh, sometimes with respiratory problems, etc. It's, it's a very good candidate, but it's a very good candidate as long as you are selecting an animal within the very first week of clinical evolution. See, if you are going much beyond sometimes animal very animals which are very chronically affected you are too late to find those lesions and sometimes you are not ending up with a diagnosis of the, the pcv2 systemic disease however you find the virus you find lymphoid tissues which are more or less normal but the animal is uh, terrifically affected but this is the chronic version that we should go at least for diagnosis to go early on and then it's much much easier to be focused and if this is happening certainly you have to change your PCV2 uh, pathology or especially uh, the, the PCV2 pl uh, vaccination planning that you may have. Is that why uh, I hear that if we do PCR tissues, it confirms a presence in, in the animal, but it's not diagnostic unless supported by other findings. I suppose that's been true for some years. Uh, uh, you agree with that. Uh, what would be the outcome if the only diagnostic result is a qpcr positive sample from samples of blood or all or all fluid these days uh, do you have a cutoff level you could suggest with qpcr for determining if a sample is confirming pcv ad honestly said peter i would not be in position and establishing a cutoff and let me explain a little bit because a uh, long time ago, we did a comparison of specifically animals affected by PCV2 systemic disease and by means of those lesions that we have uh, just described here. And we did quantitative PCR in serum of those animals. And we observed that at the population level, by means of that particular 
quantitative PCR used, uh, a level of 10 to the 7 PCB2 genome copies per email was correlated with, correlated with the diagnosis of PCB2 systemic disease. But it was at a collective level, not at individual level, because at individual level, we can find 10 to the 7 in animals which are even healthy, and we find less than 10 to the 7 in animals clearly diseased. So this is something very important because at that time we used a, a quantitative PCR which we compared with the quantitative PCR of some Danish colleagues. And the PCR of the Danish colleagues yielded 1.2 locks more for the same value that we had ourselves. So if our cutoff was 10 to the 7, for them the cutoff should have been 10 to the 8.2 or 8.4. And with the current techniques that they are uh, used, uh, there's a, a kit which is widely used all over the world, they are even much more sensitive. So probably that all 10 to the 7 is not anymore a cutoff value for those novel PCRs. And it's not the same to look at the serum than to look at the tissue. Because if you look at the lung, and especially in foid tissues, the quantitative PCR, you have to add two or three or even four logs more in order to be to have a value that probably correlates with the systemic disease. So from this point of view, I believe that the quantitative PCR is a nice technique that offers you interesting information, but I do not consider it as a good diagnostic tool. It's just an approximative one. And very importantly, nowadays we reach a point in which sometimes it looks like that what I have to do if I have any suspicion of PCV2? Do a quantitative PCR. No. The first thing that you have to do is to look at the pigs, uh, examine the animals in the right way, see if you see clinical signs which are really compatible with them. And then, please, do this histopathological exercise, which sometimes it looks like old-fashioned, but it's really useful for the diagnosis. And if you want to do a quantitative PCR in order to monitor the presence of the virus, even the amount of the virus, this could be a very interesting, let's say, a complementary approach, but it should not be the sole approach because sometimes you may have some wrong assessment about what's going on, especially when your values that you get is 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. What does this, this mean? We are close to the having disease. We are not close to having disease. It will, may depend on the genetic background of my pigs. It's that there are many variables that do not allow explaining just by quantity and PCR if I'm in front of a problem or not. However, if you are asking me, but it's better to be negative, right? Yes, of course. If the virus is not circulating, it means that the virus is not causing detrimental effects on your pigs. And of course, the lower the viral titer you may have, the better. But the reality is that this is an ubiquitous pathogen which is still circulating in our farms and the point is to try to protect from a clinical point of view as your first objective. So quantitative PCR is useful, but take care. Take care on that. Thank you very much. Actually, what you've said is, you know, these are useful exercises, but vaccination, you're saying, is working for us at the moment. Uh, you're saying that the techniques we developed over the years are still uh, the ones we should be using to investigate, and that uh, the situation on the farm has not materially altered in that case. Uh, so it's always... A, a, in all senses, from my point of view, a, a positive message from you that PCV2 is evolving, but it's not yet giving us a situation where our control of PCVAD is being threatened. Would that be a, a safe summary in your view? I think so at this point, because at least we do not have any evidence that the current variation of genotypes are jeopardizing the effect of the vaccination. So from this point of view, I'm not afraid. And if I should send a message to, to producers or veterinarians, is that the use, the current use of existing vaccines should protect against PCV2 systemic disease. If you still diagnose PCV2 systemic disease by means of the uh, standard diagnostic criteria, then what you should do is probably to investigate what's going on.
because an investigation here, for example, the quantitative PCR serology plus the uh, histopathology and detection of the virus in tissues can be of great help. Because as I told you before, this change in epidemiology may cause that early infections jeopardize the effectiveness of your vaccine. But remember, if you have concomitant diseases like PERS at the time of PCV2 vaccination, you are also jeopardizing the effect of PCV2 vaccine. Sure. So we have but, to be very uh, inclusive altogether. Yeah. But so you're saying stay vigilant as yep. we should be as vets. And also you said earlier, keep monitoring because what is happening with the genetic identity of the virus could yet be something that we have to take into account in some way. Now, I'm afraid, Professor, that we've run out of time on this particular podcast, and I wanted to ask you some more about genotypes. I, you very kindly agreed to another conversation with me, and in that second conversation, I would like, please, to just talk to you a little bit more about those genotypes of PCV2 and other forms of PCV. But for the moment, may I say thank you, Thanks to our listeners and viewers. You've been following us on an episode of Meet the Expert where we've been talking about the porcine Zerka virus type 2 with Professor Joachim Segalis in Barcelona. And as you've heard, we'll be having a further conversation with him about Zerka viruses. But for the moment, thank you for joining us and stay tuned. Just before you go, we hope you've enjoyed hearing our conversation with the most recent winners of the annual European PERS Research Awards. Bear in mind that next time, one of the winners could be you. Beringer Ingelheim is again providing three awards of €25,000 to fund the winning PERS Research Studies in Europe and is particularly interested in practical proposals. The deadline for submissions is the first day of July and more information can be found on the website pers.com. We hope to hear from you.